Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm here to share an incredible work with you. Just a quick reminder before we get started. All sources and images will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find the link in the episode description as well as on our Instagram at accessible.art.history. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. This week, we are jumping a few hundred years forward in time from Kredios Boy. Landing in Hellenistic Greece, this episode will focus on the incredible sculpture of the winged Nike of Samothrace. Dating from between 250 and 190 BCE, this piece is often considered to be one of the greatest works of art in history. In addition, the winged Nike is one of the few original Greek sculptures to have survived relatively intact throughout the centuries. Although she is missing her head and arms, Many of the Greek sculptures we have today are actually Roman copies. Today, the winged Nike stands proudly in the Louvre, telling her story for all to see. This sculpture is larger than life-size, standing in at just over 8 feet tall or 2.4 meters. That does not include the boat prow that she is mounted on. As her name suggests, she is a manifestation of the goddess Nike. In the Greek pantheon, Nike is the messenger goddess of victory. She flies around the nation, telling the victorious deeds of those who worship her. This piece is made out of gray and white Thracian and Parian marbles. These were some of the finest marbles in the Greek Isles, clearly marking this piece as extraordinarily sacred. The Samothrace part of the sculptures is the place of its discovery. In ancient times, this was a particularly popular religious site with sailors. We'll talk more about this later in the episode. So, combined with the prow she is standing upon, this indicates that the winged Nike is celebrating a naval victory. Stepping forward, the winged Nike seems to be walking into the wind. Her dress whips out behind her and the thin fabric clings to her body. With her shoulders straight and her pose firm, the viewer gets a sense of her pride, triumph, and confidence. Nike is proud of the sailors she represents and their victory she proclaims. These emotions create drama within the space and around it. We can see the story unfolding before our eyes. This piece was most likely intended to be viewed from a three-quarter degree angle because of the level of finishing found around the work. Despite this dramatic narrative, there is a sense of grace and balance to this piece. Nike's body is perfectly proportioned, something viewers can see despite her missing arms and head. She is stabilized by a slight curve that is accentuated by a contrapposta pose. We went into full detail about this pose in our last episode, so make sure to check it out. These details give the sculpture an incredibly lifelike appearance, as if she could walk off the prow and into the crowd. The final detail of this visual analysis is Nike's wings. Although only one of them is original, the other was created as a mere image and is likely as close to the original as possible. Our historians have consulted with ornithologists over the years, and they have discovered that the feathers do not resemble any known bird species in the area. This means that they were likely made up by the artist to show that Nike was not of this world. On the statue itself, there is no written indication of which battle she is meant to be associated with, so historians and art historians have had to combine forces and try and narrow it down. Ideas range from the Battle of Salamis in 306 BCE to the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. One of the most popular theories is that this statue was commissioned by Macedonian king Antigonus II Gnatis to celebrate his victory over the Egyptian ruler Ptolemy II. They met at the Battle of Kos in 255 BCE. The main reason that this theory is so popular is the location of the statue's discovery. Samothrace was especially sacred to sailors and Macedonian kings. In fact, legend states that Alexander the Great's parents, King Philip II and Olympia, met there during a religious ceremony. So, it makes sense that the winged Nike was commissioned by a Macedonian victor and placed here. But it's important to remember that this is just one of several theories and any one of them could be the truth. As we just discussed, the winged Nike was discovered in Samothrace. This island is situated in the northeastern part of the Greek Isles. It was never a major player in the political ring due to the fact that it doesn't have a natural harbor that would allow for trade to prosper. However, it did develop into a religious center. We're going to discuss the specifics later in this episode. In 1863, French diplomat and amateur archaeologist Charles Champasseau traveled to Samothrace in hopes of finding artifacts for the Imperial French collection. About a month after he arrived, workers discovered several fragments of the statue. They spent more time searching for the heads and arms, but when it became clear that they were lost, everything was packed up and sent to the Louvre for restoration. It took a full year for everything to make it safely to Paris. 
About a decade later, excavations revealed the pieces of the prow. At first, archaeologists weren't sure if it was a part of the statue, but they decided to send it to Paris anyway. Once they arrived at the Louvre, it was clear that they were. Everything fit together like a giant ancient Grecian puzzle. It took a full ten years for the restoration project to be completed. In 1884, the statue was finally put up for public display. Curators chose to place it at the top of the newly finished Derue staircase in the Louvre. This made it the focal point of the museum's collection. Today, the Louvre is the most visited museum of the world. Ten million people a year view the statue, making it one of the most popular pieces across the globe. Since its introduction to the world, the statue has only left public view twice. The first time was in 1939. Nazi forces were threatening invasion, and the curators of the Louvre knew they had to do everything they could to protect their cultural heritage. The winged Nike and other treasures were packed up and whisked away to the Chateau de Valence. Thankfully, they were safe and reinstalled after World War II's end. In 2013 to 2014, the statue underwent a major restoration. The main goal was to restore the color of the marble to its original glory. Years of public viewing had led to a layer of tarnish and patina. In addition, this was the curator's chance to study the piece with new technology. So x-rays, UV, and infrared scans were done to get a better understanding of the winged Nike. This data also allowed for minute cracks and breaks to be repaired before they became a bigger problem. Next, we're going to discuss how the winged Nike fits into the realm of Hellenistic sculpture. But first, we're going to take a quick break. everyone, I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about what software I use to bring Accessible Art History, the podcast, to life. It's called Anchor, and it's truly made a difference in my mission of making art history fun and easy to learn about. Although I'd always thought about adding a podcast to my content creation, the thought scared me. I'm not an audio engineer or a tech guru, but Anchor makes it so easy. You can use their website or app to record, edit, and spice up your audio with music. They partner with you to make your podcast a success. Not only do they take care of distributing it to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, but they even match you up with sponsors with no minimum listenership required. It makes creating a podcast easier than I honestly thought possible. But the best part? It's absolutely free to use. As someone who is in the beginning stages of content creation, I'm so thankful to have a free platform that helps me create a quality podcast. If you want to get started on your own podcast, simply go to anchor.fm that's A-N-C-H-O-R-F-M, or download their app on your preferred app store. Thanks so much for listening. All right, now that we're back, let's dive into the world of Hellenistic sculpture. The dating of this period relies on the exploits of one man. Alexander the Great. His campaigns across Europe and Asia helped spread the ideas about art and learning that the Greeks had spent years cultivating. So, our historians date this artistic style from 323 BCE, the death of Alexander the Great, and 31 BCE, the Battle of Actium, where the last vestiges of his once great empire fell to Roman forces. The hallmarks of this style are the attention to naturalistic detail while still creating a narrative. Artists of this era worked hard to create a realistic depiction of their subjects. Gone were the days of stiff, unmoving forms of archaic art. Instead, the focus was shifted on creating a body that both moved in its own space and the space around it. There was also an attention to the smallest of details, such as in the fold of the fabrics or position of the hands. In addition, the majority of these works shifted away from funerary or anonymous figures, but instead to honor the gods and goddesses of the Greek pantheon. Works were created to both glorify the deities, but to also tell the fantastical tales of their exploits. By doing this, artists were able to preserve their tales for generations to come. In fact, when many of these works were rediscovered in the 15th and 16th centuries, they provided a reawakening of both subject matter and design for a new generation of artists. As we just talked about, it was during this period that artists began fully depicting their gods and goddesses in their true forms. Ancient Greece is the first time in history that we see fully human deities. In past civilizations, there were gods and goddesses with human elements, but they were not fully human. For example, ancient Egyptian deities were often half human and half animal. Despite these differences, a lot of the basics of religion were still the same. 
For example, there were multiple gods and goddesses, each ruled over their own domain, like Poseidon over the sea and Hades over the underworld. They lived on Mount Olympus, watching humanity from above. When they wanted to visit Earth, these deities would travel and stay within their temples. You see, temples were not just houses of worship. In fact, they served as homes for the gods and goddesses they represented. Priests and attendants would take care of the space, offer sacrifices, and perform rituals. Today, we only have a vague idea about what these rituals were because ancient authors were reluctant to record something so sacred. One surprising fact about the ancient Greek religion is that women were allowed to participate in the priesthood. They were not just relegated as attendants, which is the case in many other ancient religions. This is unusual because women were often excluded in other elements of Greek society. The religious ceremonies that took place at Samothrace were a bit different from the standard ones that took place in other areas of ancient Greece. As mentioned before, this island was sacred to sailors. Greece grew to power by developing their maritime skills. The main area of worship was called the Sanctuary of the Great Gods. The focus of the sanctuary was some sort of mystery cult or religion. This means that the rituals were meant only for the initiated eyes and even were forbidden from discussing what went on during them. What records do survive indicate that they focused on the protection of sailors at sea. Some of the most famous names in Greek history and mythology worshipped at Samothrace. Hercules, Jason, Cadmus, and Orpheus all took part in the sacred rituals, making this site quite legendary as well. Maybe they even sacrificed sheep and lambs to the gods for protection or offered their own versions of the winged Nike and Thinks. One of the most important things we can learn from the winged Nike of Samothrace is the intersection of art and religion during this point in history. It's important to note that this is not an example of art for art's sake. The statue was not made simply to be a beautiful decoration. The artist made it beautiful to honor the goddess Nike. Its purpose was to bring her honor through its worship. Art and religion were one and the same in ancient Greek society. The winged Nike of Samothrace is one of the treasures of ancient Greece. Her Hellenistic beauty tells us a lot about how these people viewed themselves and their gods. It represents a movement towards naturalism, an expression of narrative, and how religion fit into their society. Today, she sits at the Louvre, proudly overlooking her many admirers. Make sure to tune in next week when we travel to ancient Rome. We are going to examine the paintings of Pompeii. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history for updates and keep an eye out for our next episode. They drop every Monday on your favorite podcast platform.